Sal Veshmeti, a man who had to be Popov since he was rising from a table where he had been sitting with Alice, stepped forward and extended his arms to embrace Schmidt. How long has it been since our freshman year? 45 years? You haven't changed, you old thief. The same red hair and the same sourpuss expression. Caught in a bear hug, accompanied by a Slavic sounding grunt, but ducking the proffer of Popov's cheeks or lips, however Popov's suggestion was to be interpreted, Schmidt kissed Alice on her cheeks, sat down and examined his host. He was thinner and more stooped. His hair, once a brilliantine smeared brown, had gone gray and wispy, but the shiny double-breasted black suit which in Schmidt's opinion cried out for the services of a dry cleaner <laughs> was a replica of the one Popov had worn day in and day out as an undergraduate. None of this was surprising. Schmidt imagined Popov's glee at taking stock of what changes the years had wrought in him, assuming that Popov bothered to look and remember. Having ordered lunch, Popov emptied his glass of wine, refilled it, and addressed to Alice a rapid stream of anecdotes interrupted only by chortles over the author he had accompanied on the book tour and a variety of literary and publishing figures to whom he referred by first name only. Schmidt didn't mind being left out of the conversation. It was not, it was not, not unlike the old days chattered among Mary and her editor and agent friends. Presumably, Alice hadn't seen Popov since his return the previous day, and absorbed by what Popov had to say, didn't attempt to sh draw Schmidt in. That, too, was more than all right with Schmidt. Being allowed to eat his leek salad in peace was better than what he had expected. However, as soon as his smoked haddock had been served, the respite ended. Popov turned for the first time in his direction and announced, you have become a powerful philanthropist, quite a step up for a lawyer. <laughs> it wasn't clear to Schmidt how this observation, which he found offensive, was meant to be taken. Never mind, he was not going to rise to the bait. I'm not very powerful, he replied, just lucky that my country neighbor, Michael Mansour, recently decided to give me a job. You may not know it, but I retired from the practice of law just about three years ago, soon after my wife died. Such a loss, cried Popov, that splendid Mary Ryan, that was her name at Radcliffe, her maiden name, Mary Ryan. Lois Witherspoon and Ginny Burbank, three roommates, each more beautiful and intelligent than the other. I bet you didn't know that I was close to them, Schmidt. They were three years behind us in college, but I took them out. I've always liked younger men. Women, I'm sorry. Younger <laughs> <laughs> Here he looked at Alice and punched her playfully on the arm. I don't think you knew Mary at college, but I got to know her well, he continued. You, my friend Gil Blackman, my roommate Kevin, all of you left after graduation, but I stayed on doing graduate work. When I went into publishing a number of years later, Mary and I reconnected, of course. What a powerhouse she was. Nobody in American publishing measured up to her. That's what I've always heard, replied Schmidt. He felt the stirring of a better feeling toward Popov. It was good of him to praise Mary in Alice's hearing. Ah, yes, and what good times we would have at the Frankfurt Book Fair. Popov rolled his eyes and smacked his lips. After a short silence, he spoke again. I had a special reason for asking Alice to bring us together. It's your neighbor and employer, Mr. Mansour. A group of us in publishing think 
this is the right time to establish a prestigious and important annual prize to honor the best work of fiction and the best work of poetry written in Arabic. The jury will be of very high quality. We think that given his Middle Eastern background, Mr. Mansour might be open to such a project and that you would be the right person to present it to. Was that the reason for this lunch? Schmidt asked himself. If it was, and if Popov and his friends have done nothing so far about approaching Mike, they must believe in the power of wishful thinking. What else would have brought about the fortuitous meeting between him and Schmidt, who just happened to have a connection to Mike and Alice, who was Popov's colleague? It's not impossible that he would be interested. Schmidt said. He does read a good deal, even if it isn't belle lettre. If you have a proposal, you should send it to his advisor, Bruce Holbein, at Mansur Industries' main office. Since this is outside the scope of the Foundation's work, Mike would anyway give it to him and not to me to review before he looked at it. I'll be glad to mention to both of them that you have spoken to me. That is very good of you, Popov said. I have another request, or maybe question. Alice told me about the foundation offices you've been visiting. Why isn't there one in Sofia? In Bulgaria? You may not know it, but I have an important connection with Bulgaria, and I consider the omission a slight. Schmidt raised his eyebrows. One reason, he answered, is the level of corruption in Bulgaria. <laughs> the foundation doesn't itself operate schools or think tanks or universities. It gives money to existing institutions and works with them, gives advice, finances visits by scholars and political leaders from other countries, and visits by local political leaders or potential political leaders to the United States. Sometimes it organizes seminars and lectures. We fear that any money we gave to practically any institution in Bulgaria would be at high risk of being stolen. I resent that. Popov had raised his voice. You asked the question, said Schmidt, so I'm giving you the answer. Popov glared at him. You think it's worse than in Romania or Hungary where you do have offices? It's a matter of degree, yes. But we've been advised it's worse. I resent that, Popov repeated. Schmidt noticed Alice's hand on Popov's sleeve. If she meant to restrain him, she didn't succeed. You may be ignorant of my personal saga, Popov continued. All I know is that you were born in Bulgaria and at some point during the war or later became a refugee, a displaced person of sorts. You are very ignorant, Popov declared. My father was the last minister of justice, serving Tsar Boris III, the heroic ruler murdered by Germans because he wouldn't let them send Bulgarian Jews to Auschwitz. My father's father was, until he died, His Majesty's court chamberlain. My grandfather died of old age in his own palace, but my father was murdered by the communists along with the Tsar's brother, Prince Kirill, and other members of the Regency Council and other high patriots. I had the good fortune to be taken into exile by Her Majesty the Tsarina. My education at boarding school and at Harvard was graciously paid for, from their imperial purse. I am on terms of personal friendship with Tsar Simeon II. He is younger than I, but we have known each other since early childhood. I find your discrimination against the country of my birth intolerable. He took on a gloomy and superior expression that took Schmidt back to the occasions, fortunately infrequent, when Popov would suddenly appear in the suite that Schmidt and Gil Blackman shared at college and jump into whatever discussion of politics and modern European history happened to be taking place. The accent when he spoke English had remained almost the same. 
an element in it of something unidentifiable but Slavic. And now that he lived in France and presumably spoke French much of the time and a mixture of something Gallic. The gurgling that accompanied the flights of eloquence, ire or hilarity hadn't changed either. That is very grand, of course, and a very sad story, replied Schmidt. I can only hope that your Bulgarian connections make it possible for you to help bring better government to your country now that it's no longer under communist rule. There is more of my story that you don't know, or you would not be suggesting so blithely that I immerse myself in Bulgarian politics. That had been my hope at college and graduate school, and also when I became the editor of Currents. I don't suppose you were a reader of that journal. Schmidt confirmed that unfortunately he was. I'm not surprised. And you don't know the defining effect of that seminal journal on political thoughts and intellectual milieus in the US and Western Europe. But not long after I assumed the direction of the journal, I met my wife. She's a member of one of France's great noble families. And it was out of the question that she settled in the United States, where Current was obliged to return because of funding considerations. She found the Philistine and petty bourgeois mentality of 99.9% .9 of your countrymen intolerable. The form of, of mentality I'm forced to add that I too could tolerate less and less. So it happened that I entered the world of publishing in France where you now find me. We were, alas, soon brought low by fate in a way that further reduced my availability for service to my country. My wife was among the last victims of a polio epidemic. Tanny Leclerc was stricken in 1956, by Solange even later in 59, soon after the birth of our second boy, paralyzed from the waist down. I am deeply sorry, said Schmidt. Popov made a snorting noise. Yes, of course, now that we have disagreed about Bulgaria, and I, you have seen how you have misjudged my position, you will be hostile to the proposal for the Middle Eastern Literature Prize. Far from it, said Schmidt. There are persistent themes in history, Popov continued. History of men and of nations. Resentments play their role. Wilhelm II, Churchill, de Gaulle. I too have been accustomed to being resented. At school, and then at college. Don't try to deny it. I carried my head too high. I was too fully conscious of my real position, so far superior to what it appeared to be. He sank <coughs> into even greater gloom. Alice, who had remained silent until then, spoke up. We really must go now. She called the waiter, and to Schmidt's surprise, paid the check. It had been clearly stated that it was Popov who was inviting Alice and him to lunch, that he refrained from protesting. They parted in the street, going in different directions. Schmidt, first with a store on the Rue de l'Université, in the window of which he had seen a layette that might just do as a baby present for little Albert, and then to the shirt maker on Place Vendôme, where he thought he might buy a necktie or two for Big Albert, he whispered. He had not covered more than a few yards, however, before looking back. He wanted to see Alice once more, even if it was only for a fleeting moment. He did see her. She and Popov were walking fast toward Ribibak with their arms around each other's waists, except that Popov's hand was actually lower. <laughs> he was patting Alice on her bottom, investigating through her summer dress the valley between her buttocks. Lot's wife looked back on Sodom and was turned into a pillar of salt. Schmidt was spared that fate. <laughs> but Alice, perhaps sensing 
his eyes upon her, turned her head in his direction. She raised her eyebrows by way of acknowledgement of his gaze and smiled comically, helplessly. He smiled back and went on to run his errands. More stop. More orange. He got to the airport at Voici in plenty of time. Quarter of six for a seven o'clock flight. Those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> Alice's plane for Nice left from Orly at five. Perhaps that loud pop up fondled all his colleagues behind, male and female. What was that to Schmidt? He didn't have Alice's telephone number in Antigua. And even if he did, he doubted he would dare to call her at her father's house, knowing that the old gentleman's friend was ill. The thing to do was to call Alice's number in Paris and leave a message in his best French, Je t'aime follement. <laughs> the call went through. He heard the first ring, then the second, and then Alice's voice. Astonished, he hung up. Had she missed her plane? Had the situation in Antibes changed? How stupid he had been to hang up instead of speaking to her. He dialed again. The line was busy and continued to be busy up to the very last minute before the flight. As usual, he fell asleep during takeoff. It was a tick, the response of his helpless body to being strapped into a seat and carried aloft in that infantilized state. The chatter of the stewardesses offering refreshments awakened him. The plane had reached its cruising altitude and the loudspeaker announced that the passengers were free to move about the cabin. Schmidt decided that the Herald Tribune could wait, even though he hadn't looked at it all day. Sipping a bourbon and devouring the mixed nuts as though he had skipped lunch, he puzzled over his failed call to Alice. No plausible explanation seemed likelier than any other. He would try to reach her the next day, Saturday afternoon, her time, and leave a message explaining that taken unawares, he had like a fool hung up instead of asking her whether anything was the matter and trying to ring again, found he couldn't get through. She'd call him back after she had listened to that message. That same day, if she was in Paris, or on Sunday when she returned from Antibes. Against his will, his thoughts turned to the interlude with Paddy Danuta, that's the lady with whom he had a little fling in Warsaw. A huge blunder. For one thing, how was he to make sure it remained an interlude? They had parted on the best of terms. Would she not expect the vodka sudden orgy a deux to be repeated on his next visit to Warsaw? How would she respond if he demurred? Would a spiteful account reach Mike Mansour? He supposed that Mike, the bon vivant, would laugh at his huffy wasp employee's caper, but his moods were unpredictable. In any event, Mike's shrugging off the incident didn't make Schmidt's appallingly stupid behavior right or any less stupid. Beyond that, what were the larger implications of his misconduct? What did it say about him? Had he ever said no to a woman who offered herself? Yes, if the transaction involved payment of money. <laughs> Otherwise, he could point to no opportunity that he had rejected, except perhaps the flirtatious propositions of old hags in the Hamptons. <laughs> Widows and writers or editors or agents gone to see. <laughs> but with the student he recruited on the West Coast, 
Korean and babysitter, Hecate and Karen, Alice, indeed Alice, and now Danuta, the pattern was the same. The bugle sounds and Schmidt jumps into the saddle. <laughs> was it because he was too unsure of himself to risk taking the first step that the woman's making herself available made him lose his head? Or was it simply his unabated appetite for sex with new partners, a curiosity he had outgrown? He wasn't sure. Did his couplings with Pani Danuta prove that his protestations of love for Alice were in bad faith? It seemed to him that such an inference was not inescapable. He was in love with Alice and was close to love and was possible at his age. Was it really true? Was it, could his short acquaintance and still limited knowledge of her justified claim, the claim of anything more than an infatuation, he concluded that it could. A lifetime of experience told him she was splendid. Another six months of knowing her would not change the judgment.